So welcome to the webinar, Billow and Amazon Sellers. Uh, glad you decided to spend your evening with us or your morning, depending on uh, what country you're in. I am Adam Weiler, founder at Sunken Stone, and I'll be leading this event today together with our speakers. Quick introduction, I'm gonna introduce them and uh, let's go ahead and kind of give us your Amazon bona fide. So Troy Johnson, co-founder of Seller Tools and Anthony Lee, subject matter expert Canon B management. Troy, why don't you uh, take a second and you know, why should people listen to you when, when it comes to Amazon? Yeah, what a great question. Yeah, thank you, Adam. I appreciate uh, facilitating and, and hosting us um, and spending time and looking forward to chat with Anthony. And a little bit about me. Uh, I started selling on Amazon in uh, 2015. Uh, was at that point in time, uh, built, uh, scaled and sold a beauty brand for uh, multiple seven figures and moved on from that to uh, consulting and advising for brands uh, in similar categories, beauty supplements. Um, and then uh, fortunately through my network connected with uh, my now partners, uh, business partners at Solo.Tools to build the, the suite of tools that we're focused on today, uh, innovating for different solutions on our platform and through our Chrome extension. Awesome. And Anthony Lee from Canopy. Okay, my turn. Um, my history in uh, Amazon. Sorry, I got a little bit of a lag here. So you're I'm good to talk and hopefully that's I, I started selling in 2014. Uh, uh, shortly thereafter, I started working for basically helped build uh, one of the first um launch services and SaaSes in the space since then i did a stint at a couple other SaaSes, so i have a lot of SaaS experience specifically in amazon world i've also been a consultant to a number of uh, brands of all sizes so you know i i jogged around the block once or twice <laughs> nice awesome and myself uh i started selling on amazon in 2007 if you can believe it, it was about six months after they launched FBA uh, Warehouse and sold my own products, had a few exits uh, out of that, and then started doing a consulting and then an agency model in about five years ago. Um, currently, we're managing about 110 brands on Amazon. Uh, we've got a team of about 30 in the States and about 65 international. Uh, so really excited. I think we've got an all-star cast today. I think... When it comes to Amazon, we're going to have the answers for it. Uh, technically, non-technically, anything software related as well. And uh, just a note for everyone watching out there. If you have questions, throw them in. And if they are relevant to kind of the, the topic or tangent we are on right now, I'll loop those in. If not, we're going to have a dedicated section at the end of the session for Q&A. So please don't hold those back. Just get your questions in and we'll queue them up and, and we'll get to all of them. So today uh, we've got a few different topics. Um, quick agenda overview. We're going to go talk about the Amazon of today, trends and changes. Then we're going to talk about the latest and greatest optimization techniques, about why next is why data is so important and why data is still king. And then finally, uh, driving external traffic. I know you're going to want to stick around for that one. Uh, it seems to be on everyone's mind these days. So hopping into the first section, Amazon of today, trends and changes. So uh, I'm going with Anthony because your name starts with an A. Um, what things about Amazon changed the most for you um, and for your company in the past half a year? The past half a year? Yeah, you okay. can expand that. Well, to, you can expand that to a year or since COVID or you know COVID, AC, AC after COVID. So, um, you know, the past six months has been really. Every six month period is actually really interesting with Amazon because Amazon is constantly changing things. Uh, what? Uh, so I guess from like the agency level, if we're talking about um, managing PPC, the biggest thing that we've seen mm -hmm. is, um, you know, cost CPCs. It's on everybody's mind right now because it's going up so much, right? Mm -hmm. um, this and what, is do you, what, 
yeah, internally when you when you're in those meetings, like what are you talking about or what are you attributing that that to? Well, you know, when we talk about it, because we've we've been around long enough to see lots of iterations of of uh, things change with regard to to advertising costs. You know, we agree that it's normal; it's a cyclical thing. First of all, every advertising platform hits a point of um, maturity where all prices go up. Right. Mm -hmm. There's that sweet period in the beginning when it's like, oh, my gosh, this is the most <laughs> undervalued real estate ever. And then over time, more and more people catch on. And that's what we're seeing, even with different ad types in the Amazon ecosystem. You know, some stuff is undervalued. Other stuff is catching up. Uh, and then on top of that, we had COVID just kind of throw everything up on its head. Right. So, mm -hmm. um we had an influx. There was a period of time when there was an influx of people coming to the site and advertising wasn't as necessary. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, people are starting to shop in person again. So advertising dollars or more of them are being pushed in there. Then we have mm -hmm. large aggregators coming in and that's how they get a leg up is by putting lots of money in advertising. So all these forces are kind of just making these wild fluctuations and and, and and costs and and it does have some people concerned but you know when we talk about it it's like look this stuff mm -hmm. levels out mm -hmm. um this is and i'm this and uh, i'm pause stick a pin in that for a second because i'm going to come back to you after troy talks about his trends because i want to ask you know how does a normal seller how does the average seller how does a brand win so i'm gonna i'm gonna come back to you for that but troy what what trends are you seeing what are what changes have you seen kind of post COVID in the last six months? Yeah, I mean, COVID, the reality, um, call it a silver lining for e commerce. COVID sort of um, it hastened, you know, e commerce evolution by, you mm -hmm. know, the tune five, 10 years. It was just, you know, whether we were ready for it or not, stay at home. You know, products products happen to end up at your doorstep across a wide array of of categories. So we just saw this. Then we have constraints at every part of the logistics chain, right? You know, you've got raw material shortages. You've got you still have e commerce in extremely high demand. Um, supply chain issues. Um, you know, the the ability to get your inventory uh, to a fulfillment center. Um, alongside all the, all the same points that, that, uh, Anthony was alluding to. So, you know, I, I sort of like to put it in the spectrum of like from, from nothing having changed to everything, we're mm -hmm. a lot closer to everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's really, um, cause I know there's tons of different topics we can dive into of, of, of aggregators of supply chain, um, of Amazon's response to strategies of Amazon releasing of tools, mm -hmm. um, so there, there has been a ton. And I think really, depending on where you're coming into uh, this market and, and being on Amazon as an agency, uh, as a software, as a seller, as an enterprise level brand, as an aggregator, I think it's really just created a pause to sort of, um, it's a lot to reflect on, um, but there's, there's, there's been a ton. There's been a ton. Mm -hmm. So I think awesome. I start from supply chain because it's, it's the most crucial step to what we do if we have a, a presence on Amazon. We can't we can't generate a dollar without a physical yep. product landing in a <laughs> Peter on a product. You can't yeah. miss that. Everything else is a moot point. <laughs> uh, awesome. Anthony, so you know, putting you definitely putting you on the spot, but what are what are some things that a brand that doesn't have VC backing or aggregator backing What's what's something a brand can do to, to at least compete and at least get their product out there if they've got something special? So, I mean, there's still a bunch of different things you can do, but let's start with the basics of Amazon, right? I'm sure anybody that's been in this space for a little while or even not a little while, anybody that's like aware of the surroundings within the Amazon ecosystem, is, particularly in the context of private label, um, has probably seen some drama recently where Amazon kind of drew the line in the sand that they don't like certain tactics for launching. And 
right now, this the question you just asked is a question on everybody's mind. They're like, well, what does the average seller do? How can you launch? How can you get reviews? How can you get ahead? And so the very first thing I would say is keep in mind that Amazon does make money from third party sellers. So they are going to give you tools to facilitate that. So rather than be concerned about the shiny objects, go back to the basics and look at the tools that Amazon offers, right? Amazon has an array of promotions uh, that they offer you, right? You can do buy one, get ones, coupons. You can put a big orange sticker right there on your listing that gives mm -hmm. you a discount. You can do virtual bundles if you have multiple SKUs. There's just so much that you can, that you really can do if you just take a step back and make a strategy around it. Um, and that's just like one way to, to kind of get more sales on top of that. There's so many people that are very sophisticated with regard to PPC. If you have the budget, definitely look at getting some help there. If that's not mm -hmm. a rabbit hole that you can fall down. Right. Um, there's yeah. so many softwares out there that like help you get all the data and put it in one place. Right. Troy's, uh, seller tools, Chrome extension, like it's free. You can literally look there gather all this data and it kind of helps you do this research uh, so you can make better decisions. So, so you you're, you're talking time. about real fundamentals, you know, real business stuff, which is promotion, marketing, great product to get data, make informed decisions. So it's, you really, um, you know, it's, it's not the sky is falling. If you're, if you've got a, a brand on Amazon, there's, there's yeah. a lot of stuff available to you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so here's the thing, right? Once upon a time in the golden era, it was it was kind of easy, right? You could accidentally uh, two, 2008, 2007, 2007. Yeah. Now it's not like that anymore. But yeah. on the on the on the other side of that, we have so we have access to so much more information than we did back then. You can make yeah. better decisions, even like even starting out without knowing anything. And so that's kind of the trade off, right? Like you do have to enter the game at a bit mm -hmm. of a higher level but you have access to better information to give you the ability to do that. And I, and I think that flows into it. I'm trying, I'm going to go to you. Um, you know, what are those ways in the last six months, last year that you are helping, you, you are seeing brands um, kind of optimize their listings. What are those uh, um, promotions that they're running that you're seeing have a, a big impact? What are the ones that are really working? Yeah, I think um, to the point of, of PPC and how stratified between the ad types, um, the different uh, the different approaches uh, now that you can take with uh, your PPC strategy, there is still the cornerstone aspect of getting your keyword research and keyword strategy really dialed in. Um, search and visibility is going to be a mainstay, organic, paid, and the you know the everything that makes up that the entirety of that picture. So. You know, we we really, and I view this both as a seller and as a software, is thinking of different ways of backing into that. Because I think usually you can fall prey to, oh, well, I'm just going to, organically, I'm just going to run a reverse ASIN and that's going to be my, the lion's share of my, you know, my keyword research. But am I diving more mm -hmm. into brand analytics? Am I harvesting from search term reports? You know, is that informing new, uh, you know, new discovery campaigns for my PPC? So there's kind of this cascade of optimization strategies that start with, hey, at the end of the day, we want to capture buyer intent that shows up with keywords. How are we how are we doing that differently? That's mm -hmm. that's the other sort of unique thing, too, because I'll, I'll admit we're, we're sort of a, we're, we're a unique software. We're not the most popular, but we approach it from a seller's mindset of what can we do differently? Because that's how we approach, you know, that's how we approach our brands is we know mm -hmm. if we do the same thing approach keywords, approach optimization in the same way, it really leaves your success to chance. So um, yeah, and the other parts I think are, are really, are truly foundational. That's what we've been championing too over this, this span of time of your foundation is the optimization. Then we explore how we automate or some of the data that informs any kind of tweaks or testing that we can do. Um, but uh, you know, uh, all of the other new things that Amazon's rolling out now with brand registry, um, you know, when you use mod, you know, modules for EBC or a plus, um, even alt, uh, the, the keywords that are used for that, um, you want to make sure that that is mm -hmm. optimized. So there is the, as and Amazon, are thinking, yeah, yeah, thinking about how your optimization shows up there as well. And there's really nifty ways too. you can look at how competitor, what uh, keywords your competitors are using. So it's sort of saying, how do I take the strategy of 
uh, of optimization and make sure that continues through all of the new resources, Amazon, you know, storefronts and posts and all of these things that are new, uh, relatively new for us as, as brands. And, and Troy and Anthony, each one of you can do this now. There's the initial build out and then there's the kind of ongoing maintenance and optimization. What does that cadence look like from your perspective? What is a solid cadence on that? How often are you going back and testing new, uh, obviously new ad campaigns is one thing, but whole new keyword strategies, new content updates, things like that on the back end. Uh, Anthony, why don't we start with you on that? Um, I don't know. I should, I should probably be a little bit more proactive with regard to that, but I'm just, I'm so sensitive to um, like kind of the history built uh, with regard to indexing, mm -hmm. especially trying to, trying to launch um, effectively during any honeymoon period. And I'm very sensitive to understanding the, the little things that affect relevance. So for me, I really try to get it right in the early part. And then mm -hmm. hopefully I'm not going to be messing with it too much. So for me, it's like heavy, heavy, heavy upfront research. Yep. Get it as right as possible, as early as possible. And then I, I kind of let that ride until things start to look. You're like seeing the KPIs well. not respond as you want them to. Exactly. Exactly. And then, and then I'm going to dive in and the first thing to do is diagnose and you know, a lot of times that stuff happens just when the, the market shifts. And I just have to, I guess, get to know Amazon's version of my customers a little bit better because uh, maybe it changed from when I launched. Um, and, and, and that oftentimes can solve the problem. And then I'm, I'm looking at like, oh, maybe there's a different word people are calling this because of a TikTok video. I need to go and insert that into my listing and start running some ads to it and, and, and you know, that, that goes a long way too. So it's, it's kind of a living, breathing thing and it awesome. changes. And, and Troy, what about, what's your thesis on, on that cadence? Yeah. Um, honestly, more recently, we've been more aggressive, um, somewhat just due to circumstance for things like it started with prices. So like, you know, passing along increases to the end customer. Um, mm -hmm. but we've even seen optimization, very practical optimization of like updating titles, uh, bullet points, descriptions. Uh, we've done that more aggressively uh, recently, and it has has on the on the whole it been a net positive. So I awesome. I similarly I think to Anthony would take the tact of like you know we have reports where we'll push out we'll pipe out like keyword ranking if we see any major disparity or drop off we'll sort of evaluate the strategy there. Um, but overall optimization, uh, detail page level optimization we we would you know maybe a quarterly uh monthly if it was aggressive at that point in time but right now yeah. i mean we're at the at the ASIN level um making a lot more adjustments uh week over week and see, seeing it be a, a positive so I, awesome. I don't know if that's, that's a good, good you know I, I always add the caveat we work with a, a healthy amount of sellers but i also know the vastness of amazon inherently it's going to be anecdotal so i, I always mm -hmm. add that little asterisk on there but i when i see it with our with our brands i'm thinking well this this could be the canary in the coal mine. This is an indication where some of what's rewarded has changed a little bit. Well, that kind of that flows into our next topic about data. Why data is still king, and and in today's ever present world, it almost seems like there's too much data. It's uh, you know data is a is a commodity now, and everyone has access to it. And for you know thirty dollars a month, you could pipe whatever whatever you want into a Google dashboard or power bi or tableau or google sheets now what are some cool data points that you guys are looking at or ratios or metrics that you're looking at and in what way are you guys uh utilizing that for amazon who wants to anthony you want to take that one first sure um I, you know i love data but i'm also one of those weird people that's like there's you you can never give me too much. I'll, I'll look at all of it. Uh, so what I'm, I'm just really excited about all the new stuff that brand analytics is opening up to all sellers, right? So for the longest time, certain data points were always gated and, and now it looks or like, hidden kind of, yeah, exactly. But now it looks like Amazon is just kind of opening it all up and, and I love it. Like actually, you know, honestly, the most exciting, I, 
this is the most excited I've been in so long. And it, it was like I was a kid in a candy store. The moment that I saw that Amazon is reporting uh, search volume um, with, uh, with the new Opportunity Explorer, mm -hmm. like I swear I probably, I, I, I probably filmed like four videos and I was just like so flustered. I didn't even sound right in any of them. So I couldn't post them. <laughs> but I was just like, this is so awesome. I, you know, anyway, so yeah, I'm really excited about a lot. Basically everything that brand analytics is, uh, is, uh, releasing. And what, and why is that? What, what is that going to do for you as a seller? What's that going to do for you as an agency? Like what, what decisions or, or changes can you make now that you, that you weren't able to before? Well, it, it's not necessarily that it changes the decision so much as now there's more confidence because we know that the data isn't uh, a calculation. It's not a speculation. We're not looking at a number and going, okay, well, based on history and what we've experienced in these limited number of categories and this and this, you know, this is probably it. Now we're looking at it. Amazon's telling us, no, this is the number. Yeah, and that's huge because now it's like okay, I can I can so much more accurately do my keyword research because I know the true volume. I know how many people are actually interested in this keyword, and 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 at the end of the day, if you're selling on Amazon, you're basically selling keywords, right? So that's a huge mm -hmm. portion of it. And then kind of having Amazon tell you where opportunities lie in your uh, paid advertising, where opportunities lie, and in their catalog where there's like an influx of people looking for products and it's underserved like amazon is now giving you that data we don't have to guess anymore so it's like wow that's that's cool now i can trust that and my my formulations are going to be that much stronger that's awesome troy what are what are you seeing on there what what, what are your hidden data gems in yeah. all the, in the sea of data <laughs> Well, I always love taking uh, data and tying it to automation, right? Of, of we touched on, you know, keywords, pu pulling in some of that data to f inform some of your performance insights, um, but then also being able to use some of the some of the data and whether it's tools or uh, other ways of achieving achieving automation, is a lot of the rule based PPC uh, as well. I think, you know, as we work with a lot of solopreneurs, a lot of uh, small operators, small teams. Um, to where even if they have Anthony level obsession and, and love of data, at the end of the day, they've got, it's got to turn into analysis and actionable. So, um, I think the, the performance side of, of data is really important too. Um, I'm going to bring it back to keywords for some of my favorites. Cause, um, again, the search volume through uh, product opportunity explorer is huge, great validation metric. Uh, one that, that we have, or if you can find it anywhere else, it, it may be out there. Um, but of course, uh, if, if we've developed it, I have a, I have a, a fondness for it. It's uh, looking at uh, conversion rate and uh, sales by keyword. And mm -hmm. that's really great to benchmark some of your uh, session and uh, unit percentage for your products at the keyword level. Uh, but then also really great at the product research and product discovery phase. So it's, it's a way in which we sort of enrich, um, and again, if this is something you can tap into elsewhere, it's just, it's more of a, a way of using data uh, in a lateral way for, for keywords. And it's really great. Troy, do you think we could, you know, could we workshop that? Let's use an example. You know, you got a, you got a bottle of turmeric supplement. Like what's, what's someone, someone, like how could someone do that in real life? Yeah. So as an example, uh, the way that we present this data is alongside brand analytics. So you can then see uh, click share, sales share. Um, you'll see the conversion share at the keyword level and then the unit mm -hmm. sales. So you get this, this kind of this picture. It's actually presented horizontally and it can let you know, let's say, let's say you're considering bringing a product to market that is, that is turmeric. Well, you look mm -hmm. at that click share and that sales share and it's, it's a pretty low number, but then you also see that the uh, conversion share is also a, a pretty small number. So you have these points of validation that say, hey, sales clicks and sales may be even, evenly distributed. That's when you can start looking at the uh, listings as well and start getting this validation of, okay, there's sort of a keyword level green light or maybe an optimization level green light. And that can take you further along to really validating a new product opportunity. So turmeric is probably a terrible example because uh, that's, you know, you're, you're jumping into the deep end, but mm -hmm. let's say you're diving into, um, you know, just product X, any other product like that. It really helps to inform some of the Amazon uh, specific data to really validate, or in some cases invalidate, if you see that conversion rate is really hiked up, well, shoot, somebody's just earning 
earning a lion's share of the sales, you can potentially see that in the top three ASINs and see, well, hey, this is this is the clear winner for this category of that keyword. Uh, and would the lion's share of sales going to those top three indicate it's a ripe opportunity or stay away from that opportunity? If it's, if it's typically the top three and they're equal weight, and then there's a major drop off. So let's say mm -hmm. that they make up 65, 70%, and they are making up a majority of the sales. Typically that tells me that there's, there's enough, um, interested competition and enough distributed sales where that may not be, uh, that may not be as obvious of an opportunity. Okay. Um, awesome. yeah, it really, it's more of a signal than it is a green light, red light. It just gives you that idea of, okay, what is the, what does the performance look like? And we marry that alongside that Amazon data. Love it. Um, something that's been a big trend recently is the Amazon attribution platform, Amazon attribution links. Anthony, you can take a second, talk to us about how you combine Amazon attribution, external traffic. Um, now we're getting to the uh, external traffic part of our uh, webinar today. So when Amazon Attribution first came out, it was highly sought after for obvious reasons, right? As much as Amazon would probably love everybody to just spend all their money on ads on the Amazon platform, um, they also love external traffic. And sometimes, you know, we might just have better opportunity with our products on other platforms, other ad platforms. Uh, Snapchat, Facebook, Google. I mean, it's a strategy many people are using. Aggregators are using it to run Google AdWords to to both gain sales mm -hmm. and rank. Um, Amazon, right. So when you do that, mm -hmm. though. As the marketer, it's like, <laughs> and I'm sure it's just as good. Yeah. I'm sure it's just as clean as putting a pixel, right? <laughs> no, it's it's definitely it's definitely had some growing pains, but mm -hmm. but you can tell that Amazon's working on making that better because they recently came out with the brand referral. So basically they're saying, look, if you're going to, if you're going to send external traffic and if you use this attribution, um, we'll, we'll give you 10% back, uh, on what you're giving us, which is huge. I mean, because if you yeah. ever calculated these fees, like they're big time margin eaters, right? So that's a great opportunity for somebody that has an established channel of driving external traffic. If you, you know, if you're good at that, if that's something that you do, man, now you can earn back some of those expenses. And that's, I mean, that's really going to help you if nothing else, put more money into your uh, external ads. So, that's awesome. um, and yeah, Troy, really have, you, have you seen similar, that's a, that's a great tactic, by the way, super high level. Um, Troy, have you seen similar stuff or what other ways have you seen brands and, and companies utilize that, that program? Yeah, I mean it's it's great to see, and I'm I'm sure you both uh, it's a long long time coming. Uh, for you know now we know the the power and the usefulness of external traffic. This is not something Anthony knows all too well in terms of a a, a ranking factor and uh, being able to drive from high domain authorities. Hence hence Google having a really great impact um, on keyword ranking uh, and driving that external traffic. So it's great to have the visibility to have the informed spend because you get both right. You get the clarity of you know, is this truly providing that ROI? And then, you know, with a, with a 60 day lag and that 10%, it's, it's, um, uh, kind of averaged across categories. So definitely make sure you see the breakdown, uh, for, um, what type of products that you're going to be referring, but that's really just kind of icing on the cake. It's sort of like a, another Amazon affiliate program they've rolled out to where it'll knock down your referral fees. You can get a little, maybe a little bit of incremental revenue there. Uh, but absolutely set it up. It's super simple. So then is, is the goal really, should the goal be to make money on this or is the goal break even with the SEO organic bump or, you know, how, how are you looking at it? And he's smiling over there. <laughs> Can you clarify that question to make money on 
And so on the actual traffic buying, on the trade sale, if you're going from your blog, your website, your Google ads platform, your Taboola ad to Amazon, are you trying to make that a positive sale? Like, are you trying to get positive ROI out of that? Or is it, let's get to break even because we're getting a kickback on the brand referral and the SEO juice? Like, how are you guys looking at it? It, it really depends. Um, so for the most part, profitable ads for to cold traffic is always difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. It depends on where your margins are at. Obviously, if you're selling like a $500 appliance, uh, this is going to be a little easier for you because you have the margin to play with. That could very well be cold traffic that's profitable. For the vast majority of people, though, I really think that um, the strategy is to try and get as close to break even as possible. Maybe be a little bit more uh, purposeful in where you're running that external traffic. So I would say, like, for example, Google ads, if you can break even there, you're going to be able to then utilize that for, like you said, SEO and for uh, an increasing rank, which is mm -hmm. going to pay dividends on the Amazon platform. Um, you know, because when you're talking about like $20 products, it's just really hard to, to find a, a cold buyer. However, with attribution, if you have the ability to feed back the data yeah. to the ad platform to learn, you can retarget um, and then, you know, at that point you actually are looking at profitable ads. But I would say, I think there's better opportunities than using DSP for that kind of thing, if you have the budget. Awesome, well, save that for a second. We'll get to, and Troy, um, you know, what's your answer to that? And then we're gonna go take a time machine forward into the future and talk about what Amazon is going to be like. Sounds fun. Um, yeah, no, for, for me, I, you know, I view it as kind of icing on the cake. It's, it's almost like that reimbursement surprise, um, where with the 60 day delay for most unit economics, um, your spend. And then if you're like, if you're running coupons, if there's a, any other value add there, it's sometimes a little hard to back out that true margin. Um, so I, I think it's, it's mostly just icing. It's kind of, it's a, it's been a nice surprise as a, a value add now on mm -hmm. the platform. Um, but depending on your category, what your, what your, you know, cost of goods and how everything shakes out right now, um, it might just be a nice little, nice little bug. Yeah. You know, recurring theme I'm hearing is there's levers available, use them and just keep adding and as Amazon adds them, keep using them. So yeah. let's jump, jump in that time machine. Um, one year, you know, who, who knows, but let's go three years in that future. Um, how has Amazon changed? I, you hear pay to play all the time. You know, what, how can that continue to evolve? What happens with logistics? What happens with ads? What happens with traffic? What happens with brands? Um, and yeah, and try to keep that to a few minutes. I know, I know that could literally be its own webinar, but, um, let, let's kind of let, and then we can free for all that you get, you guys can have, let's make turn this into kind of a combo and popcorn style session. The three year, the three year vision. This is cool. I like this. I like this topic. So, uh, pay to play obviously has grown. I mean, like, think about it, man. Three years ago, if you had asked like, what's that going to look like? People would have had no idea that, Oh, the first 12 spots on, on a browse page on Amazon or ads. Now, um, I don't think that's going anywhere. I think they're going to find ways to, uh, put paid distribution in places we didn't even think of right now. Like, Oh, you could fit an ad in between those pictures. Like, what? <laughs> like we're going to, we're going to see that, but, but they'll do it tastefully. It won't look like a hot mess. Uh, I think, uh, you know, because they really do care about the aesthetics. So we're going to see more of that. Uh, from the seller's perspective, though, um, right now, moving into the future, uh, what I see is uh, smart sellers that are really interested in, you know, taking advantage of the opportunities before they become saturated uh, are going to start moving more and more into demand side platform DSP for a couple reasons. One, degradation of the cookie. Amazon's walled garden is only going to get broader. They're only going to buy up more properties. And the more properties they buy up, the more 1P data you have access to. And right now, this is undervalued real estate. In three years, it'll probably have leveled out. You're going to have a ton of people out there. Amazon's going to own half the world, probably with regard to digital assets and property. Um, 
so you know it'll be a little bit more crowded of a space but uh what we'll see is you know people are going to start businesses on amazon still but they're going to absolutely have to allocate larger budgets like you're going to go into it just like people do now with shopify and know okay well i have to have like a thousand dollar a month budget for ads or else i'm not even gonna be able to play this game right it's just mm -hmm. going to become the reality of the situation at that point uh you'll see a ton more opportunities though for uh, greater visibility if you if you offer value and a unique brand i think amazon is really interested in fleshing out their catalog in every single category like hands down they just want something that's going to appeal to their audience in every category and it's a big catalog there's a lot of categories so we're not quite there yet so that's the reason why they do all these programs with brands and i think in three years what we'll see is small brands grow big and amazon's going to facilitate a lot of that because they're going to be like well here's a hole that we aren't filling so mm -hmm. you can fill it and they're going to give that distribution and that visibility to to that brand and we're going to see a lot more of that so it'll be a much more mature platform there'll still be opportunity because there's more buyers added than sellers every year um it will get a little bit more expensive it will be pay to play it'll also be a little bit more established people will kind of see the ladder in front of them it'll be like okay this is the rule set you have to play by and these are the opportunities you and, have and these are and right. as a brand as a seller you know if amazon what what percent is amazon of your attention focus right now what percent will it be in three years will it be a larger share of mine uh, mind share a larger percent or will it be a smaller percent because i'm i've got to be on wish and walmart and and all the others or do they just eat the world <laughs> I think uh, I think that I have a conspiracy theory that somebody is going <laughs> to come in with a mobile only or like AR magic platform for shopping that is going to topple the, you know, the king of the mountain that is Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw this actually play out in Taiwan. One app came in and basically took out their their main guy. Um, I have a conspiracy theory, but half of it is really like wishful thinking because Amazon <laughs> kind of makes me mad sometimes that that's <laughs> going to happen. But I do think we're going to see some other players, some established players that have really been trying hard to compete kind of rise up. Um, I, I don't know that it'll be like, oh, Amazon's only 10% now because I have all these marketplaces open to me. I don't know that it'll be that, but it'll be, they might lose a little bit of their market share because Walmart mm -hmm. is actually making some big, important plays. I think we'll see uh, players like Etsy get more serious. Um, and, and so it'll it'll mix it up a little bit. Maybe it'll go from like where it is now at like 80%, probably down to maybe 60% in three years. Okay, awesome. Troy, what, uh, you know, you've got your time machine cap on. What What's different? What are you seeing? Yeah, uh, I th I think the the pay to play is uh, is definitely a piece of the, the continuity. I, I agree with the scope of what's, what we've already seen in terms of ad types, mediums, I mean, DSP alone to use it in its entirety at an expert level is a, a small army probably isn't enough. Um, it, there's just so much that you really can do if you use what is available right now to its fullest potential. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the indication um and all of the additional properties and more of the, the, uh, the acquisitions that, that Amazon will for sure uh, take advantage of. That footprint gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, my concern is that it squeezes out the smallest part of our market. Um, it's it's the folks that are the small operators, the solopreneurs, um, a lot of folks that, that we will work with that are uh, entrepreneurial in spirit, but they loved and have loved a relatively low barrier of entry to a relatively, relatively predictive a predictable business model where there is a somewhat clear sequence of steps um, that have been sort of the mainstay. And I think those steps may be changing a little bit too. And, you know, there's little things, you know, brand registry and other things that Amazon has sort of done to make sure that what's on market is legitimate. It's authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives their customers the trust. And hence, that's why when you're registered, you get these slew of tools and solutions. So I think, I, I think we have a few signs of what the future can already look like. Um, I think what's other, what else is interesting just from the ones that I have and we touched on Opportunity Explorer 
is what Amazon is really going to uh, start doing and, and having impact on some of the other cottage industries. I mean, we as a software, we do offer unique solutions and tools, but Amazon, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, Opportunity Explorer Pro is kind of like, well, hey, we kind of can cannibalize yeah. entire segments of cottage industries. And so um, it that I think will also be interesting because we're all riding this whale together, right? This is, if you, if you have a presence on this platform, um, in, an, in any one of those capacities, the status quo sometimes is um, we, we prefer it. Uh, it's it's a it's a safe place. Uh, but I think you know, and again, this is at the macro level, is that it lends itself to if you are innovative, if you're willing to embrace the change that is Amazon. Um, that one year, two year, three years, you know, it's still a highly leverageable um, e-commerce giant. So I, awesome. we'll see, yeah, we'll see what yeah. this looks like. If, if it sounds like embracing the change, you can't fight it. I remember, you know, back in 2007, there was like six different things on the drop down menu. And now, now there's like 300. And in the beginning, I was like, no, no, no. And now I realize, like, oh, that's why we have businesses. That's why people pay us to be experts on Amazon, is because for each new feature, for each new opportunity rolled out is exponentially harder uh, make to do it. And the, the brands, the sellers, the agencies, the service providers that continue to adapt and, and overcome um, will be the winners in here. So we've got a few minutes left. A lot of people um, have been putting questions in the Q&A section. If you've got a question, please drop it in here and we'll get to it. And I'm gonna uh, start by tossing this one to Anthony. Um, from Ron, how could the average Joe start selling on Amazon? What kind of realistic budget should someone expect to spend to get started with the first product? That's a great question. The thing is, is what it ignores is the different ways that you can sell on Amazon. I think that Amazon offers opportunity for people at pretty much any level of budget. Um, if we're talking about the private label model, I strongly, I've seen it done where I've watched somebody actually launch like a product that they kind of mixed around to make three different variations and successfully launched uh, with $5,000. I personally feel more comfortable with 10. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about private label. How much do you need? I would say that I think 10 is a, a safer bet. And is that, that is for, that's your dry powder for ad spend, or is that your, including your cost of goods as well? That's every, that's everything, right? Okay. So if you have a, if you have a, a $10,000, I would say, try to break that up into thirds, right? So 3,300 of that uh, is your budget for your first inventory order, 3,300 mm -hmm. of that, that is your, okay, I'm going to use this for ads and then 3,300 for various other uh, uh, marketing, maybe sock a little bit of that away for, uh, for emergencies. Um, but ultimately, on the lowest- Not impact, terrible. Like, don't, this is where doable. I say, you, can, yeah. you can save that up. You could budget that 10,000 for something that could turn into, you know, quarter million, half a million, million dollar business. Like totally, yeah. that's, a, that's a great path today in 2021. Keep in mind though, that the, the, the lower your starting capital, the more of an uphill struggle it is, right? If you when you, you run out of that, table, you run out of that inventory when, when you do have some traction. No, that that's a tough pit of despair right there. Exactly. So if you come to the table with fifty grand, mm -hmm. you're going to be in a little bit better of a situation. You can stock away a little bit more inventory, maybe in another warehouse. Uh, you can. I mean, you have coffers uh, to play with. If you if you see a play in marketing, that's just like. This is going to be expensive, but I know I can win. You have the budget to play that game. And then if it pays awesome. off, you know, you're a player. <laughs> so. And Troy, this question's from Renisa Clark. Can you elaborate on the type of research that you conduct that is key? I guess when you're, you know, let's go with Anthony's example. You you were going in for your first product. You know, what, what type of research are you doing to make sure it's, uh, you're, you're at least setting yourself up for success? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the simplest level, um, and I always try to just view it kind of from the top down is validating both sides is you want the, the supply question and the demand demand question sort of answered, right? Um, does that let you know if there's potential entry into, uh, into a market? So 
typically we'll look at competitors. So if you're running a search, let's say on your main or master keyword, what does the competitive landscape look like for who's winning for your main keyword? That's the current supply. And it kind of brings us back to the prior point of diving into that keyword and then saying, okay, distribution of sales, uh, click share, conversion share. Um, also with that estimated revenue at the keyword level, you can, yes, take your main keyword and usually about three to five other keywords to give you a sense of, okay, what is the expected revenue if I truly win uh, a, a given keyword? And then um, the demand will show up in things like search volume. How many people are actively seeking it out? How can we validate that now with a, a tools data or with with uh, the uh, the Amazon source data now? And there's a few other things that you can look at. I have honestly, every time, so just as an example, because there is anomalies out there, is I've fallen in love more with categories and just essentially said, okay, in these categories, what does the optimization landscape look like? Mm. So who's really doing a great job of, of their keywords, their detail page? Are they brand registered? What does their assets and media look like on their, uh, on their detail page to, be in, to ensure that they're conversion ready? Um, if they even earn the clicks, if they earn those sessions. So I, I throw that out there because there's sort of atypical ways. Um, and there, there's been a number of courses and teaching, uh, you know, teaching that have, have said, okay, BSR price point is kind of the trope of the product research. And I would highly encourage if you see that sort of see what they're trying to do and think about how you can use other data to sort of arrive at something similar, but unique. So there's, there's a lot of different ways to, to, to sort of tackle it. Uh, what I will say is try to get your hands on Amazon's Opportunity Explorer. Uh, that source data, they're sort of curating what you want to look at for the niche level, the product. And is that, is that the thing, is that still in beta for a number of accounts, but they're rolling it out? You, what you'll see, if you've got a good friend that has it, um, it's going to elude me now. There's actually a, a, an email that you can send to uh, the team and they will permit you access uh, to that tool. We did it for a brand. It took two yeah. days. So awesome. no, other, no other questions. There's the hack right there. And that, I hope you stuck around till the end of the webinar because that, that's gonna that's worth your time right there. That's awesome. Um, so question about expansion on uh, into Amazon Global, um, FBA, FBM, con competitive considering the price of shipment taxes. Uh, I, I mean, I'm of the opinion it's like, you know, nail US first and then evaluate whether it makes sense from a from a standpoint of time, effort, labor to add another product here in the States or then take your hero product overseas. I don't know if, um, if you guys have similar thoughts around that as far as how you prioritize international versus home market. I'm of the opinion that um this is the tough one like when do you mm -hmm. go international versus when do you stack the you know the the catalog here's the thing though uh, i've seen it kind of play out over and over again and this isn't there's it's never this the the same every time right but i've seen it play out a few times where you know not every product succeeds Right. You can have, I mean, obviously you want to add as many SKUs as possible, but there's always going to be a percentage of them that just underperform. Uh, some of them are like just killers. Um, uh, and then in others, you know, uh, actually take off. So uh, the thing is, though, is while people in different cultures are different, we're all very similar. So if you have a product with mass appeal and, and you know, if, if you're if you're honest with yourself and the world, most products that do well on Amazon of mass appeal, because I mean, you know, Amazon's a giant, it's not, it's not a niche marketplace, right? So you got to think about that. You got to intelligently look at that and go, okay, I have a product that's doing really well on the US marketplace. And it wasn't that hard for me to do this. Could it be that easy for me to go to Germany with the same product in the same process? Could it be that easy for me to go to Italy with the same product in the same process? And if you really analyze it, you do some research over there and you're like, hey, you know what? People around the world are using this product. You could be doing yourself a disservice if you don't take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so definitely analyze that. There is potential. There is volume. And, and it's, you know, it's always 
trade off. What can you focus on? You can't do two things at once. Is that, and that was a question from Ben Shoji. Thank you for that question. And let's, uh, last question. Uh, you know what? I'm going to uh, um, defer. This one was a, a, an alley oop for our, um, for our friends here at Billow. How do you use Billow content in your listings? And let's, let's combine that with a bigger content listing. Um, you know, how do you use video? How do you use great assets? What are those? What's the difference between an okay listing and an amazing uh, optimized listing? And uh, Troy, why don't you start with us and, and answer with me. Take it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, to this uh, question and to the point of like looking years ahead too, Adam, um, Amazon is going to consistently more and more look like a social media platform. And that's where media rich assets and videos are going to play a, a huge part in that without question. Um, but there's other specific examples, video ads, related video shorts, um, you know, image or uh, videos in uh, uh, videos in seven uh, above the fold. Uh, for a detail page. There's other sort of sneaky ways that Amazon lets you have more uh, media rich assets in your listing. But what that really helps with, and this is where you know customers new to brand, new to your product, have never seen you before, that's really going to help not only add some polish, but some legitimacy, which has a really strong impact on trust and authority that generates... Uh, translates into more revenue generating activity. So it's both a macro trend that we're seeing of it just simply being more of a social media. Because again, think about it from Amazon's perspective. If you got a customer spending more time in your marketplace, they're probably going to be spending more money too, right? There is a, usually a correlation there. Um, and there, where that benefits us as brands is the touch points that we that then have access to, to make sure that we're making the most of that real estate. Because that Related video shorts, it's a whole horizontal bar right along, right on your listing. Mm -hmm. You can have competitors throw up their videos on there. So you want to own that real estate, you know, user generated content, how to videos, FAQs of how to, you know, make sure that the buying experience is optimal. So yeah, there's no shortage of ways, not, not just with reviews. Of course you can encourage, uh, you know, this, this wouldn't be a billow, uh, option necessarily. <laughs> um, but if you have, uh, you phrase it the right way. Like yeah. You got to be careful around TOS stuff, but yes, there. You know, I'm sure there's people on Billow platform that that would love to buy your product and review it. Oh yeah, or on unboxing. There's all kinds yeah. of different thematic, I would say, videos that you can do, um, and then that that can just be sprinkled throughout your your listing. Because you have to remember, we for I think we forget this as as Amazon centric brands and brand owners is that that detail page can be the the very first, that's the first impression. Uh, of who you are and what you do. So if you have the option to make it more uh, engaging, more interactive uh, to a degree of, of viewing videos and content, um, you are probably more likely to succeed in the comparison, compare and contrast landscape that is the Amazon marketplace. Awesome. Anthony, take us home. What are, what are your thoughts on Bill and great listings and, and how it can help with the, with the brand's presence? Um, I think, uh, first of all, video has proven time and time again across the board to always be uh, the most engaging type of content. Like until a fourth dimensional extra like above video option exists, video will all, and ever since its invention, it just, you know, there's been scientific studies uh, done on it, the way it activates the brain, like being able to see things in moving uh, sound, you know, engaging more of the sense, almost as many senses as you would if you were in person is always going to work more. Aside from that, user generated content is king. It always will be, period. People want authenticity, especially younger millennials, Gen Z, the current basically controllers of the market right now. The people who are actually buying on Amazon, like these people care about authenticity, right? So when you combine these things, when you have uh, authentic video, you uh, that's a recipe for something that's going to get engagement. Engagement wins the day because engagement gets the eyeballs, right? And you can use these not just on your, not just on your, uh, your Amazon listing and your Amazon ads, but uh, here's my hack right now, undervalued real estate, Snapchat ads. TikTok ads, 
TikTok is actually getting kind of competitive, but still not enough people know how to use it yet. Snapchat, people sleeping on it all over the place. These are video platforms where you run ads with video. The more authentic that video looks, the better those ads are going to perform, the more sales you're going to make. And we're talking sales to cold um, audiences too. So it's powerful. Love it. Love it. I think this was awesome. You guys heard from two of the best in the Amazon game. Uh, I hope you took a bunch of notes and I believe, you know, people should listen to this, re rewatch it, download it, get those numbers up. But uh, thank you for the great questions. Thank you, Anthony Lee. Thank you, Troy Johnson. Um, any final thoughts, final words, and then we can get out of here. Uh, be well and do good things. If you have any um, questions, you can reach out to me, Anthony Lee 991 on every social media platform. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions. That's a great point. Try how do people get a hold of you? Yeah, and Anthony is a great follow. I highly encourage that. Um, but yeah, we are uh, at seller.tools. You can reach uh, reach us, download our free Chrome extension, reach out to me or our team at hello at seller.tools. We'd love to hear from you, see how we can support you and geek out on all things all things Amazon. Awesome. I'm Dan Weiler. Oh, go ahead, Anthony. Download the free Chrome extension, Seller Tools. From <laughs> yeah, nice. It's really, no, it's re like, look, I I make videos looking at this stuff and I looked at their stuff and it's really good. So do it. Badass. And thank you, I'm Adam Weiler with Simon Stone. Thank you for joining us. And we are done in five seconds. So thanks, you guys. That was great.